Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, commence with two anecdotes. Uh, the first relates to two rabbis in Jerusalem who were discussing the laws of Purim before the onset of the festival, and they were focusing on matanot la'evyonim, the gifts that are given to the destitute on the day of Purim according to Jewish law. And they were wondering, in Hebrew, there were various words to describe the poor, ani, dal, rosh, avion. And they decided that the word avion has the connotation of someone who is completely bereft. Uh, in England, we would say he lives in a cardboard box. He doesn't have any clothing. And uh, they decided that they must find such a person on Purim Day in order to fulfill the mitzvah properly. So they both set out uh, on Purim morning, and um, after a while they met up. One was in a state of great anxiety. The other was literally ecstatic. He'd found a poor man who fitted the bill, Beirom of Choser Kol, and uh, he'd given him the required donation. And the other one says, please tell me where I can find this um, person so that I too can do the mitzvah. And the other person says to him, oh no, I'm keeping him for next year. Now, um, the uh, other anecdote was, uh, was a personal one, that in the laws of the Shema, the recitation of the Shema, there is great emphasis on articulating each word carefully, every syllable, every letter, one mustn't slur, one mustn't run one word into the other. So elocution is important for the recitation of the Shema precept. But in the third portion of the Shema, there's one word, Laman Tiz Karu, in order that you shall remember. And there you must place a, an emphasis on the Zion, on the word, the letter Tiz, tiz Karu, the Z or the Z. It should be a proper buzz, Tiz. It shouldn't be an S, it should be a Z. Why? Because Tizguru means in order that you should remember the commandments of the Lord. Tizguru with an S would mean in order that you should receive reward. We don't want to give the connotation as if we're serving God for ulterior motives, so therefore we emphasize the Zion. So here I was in Jerusalem, the holy city, and I watched someone say the Shema, beads of perspiration pouring down his forehead as he makes his way through the three passages. And um, when he comes to the words, Laman Tizkaru, he really can't get it right. The Zion, until after some trying, even then the word is divided into two, Tizkaru. And he, out of sheer frustration, he says in Yiddish, Irazolt Gedenken. So um, after the service, I somewhat... Um, ambivalently approached him and I said, excuse me, it's none of my business. I was impressed with uh, your Shema. But uh, do you really think it's worthwhile investing so much energy and effort in this one word, Tizkaru? And he looked at me as if, uh, just like I'm looking at uh, Rabbi Lowenthal now, and he said, uh, could you imagine how much reward I'll get for that? LAUGHTER Now, um, sometimes we could actually be laughing at ourselves because there is this sort of pan halachic approach which is uh, dominant in many societies, many orthodox or religious societies across the board, whereby the experience of halacha, which is all-encompassing from the moment that one rises one morning till the moment one ties one's shoelaces the next morning, uh, the halakha is an all-encompassing uh, discipline and regime. And uh, one can become so absor absorbed in the detail, the minutiae of the halakha, that it um, almost serves as an anti-spiritual discipline, undermining the spirituality of the laws, of those very laws that people are trying to observe, ironically. Um, 
It is axiomatic, though, that really Jewish law uh, has a value system behind it. You know, be behind every halachist, there is an agadist. And um, it's not just about a legal, legal parameters that govern any particular uh, question. Now, there are certain laws, uh, uh, and I go here according to the order of the alphabet, somewhat, where I've seen Teshuvas, and I could discuss them all, but not in 20 minutes, laws concerning adoption, concerning bioethics, concerning Christianity, concerning drugs and substance abuse, concerning egalitarianism, uh, partnership minyonim, concerning fertility issues, concerning Geirut, conversion, concerning interfaith dialogue, concerning uh, Holocaust issues, concerning Israel and territorial concessions, concerning juvenile rebellion, messianism, love and marriage, mamzerim, illegitimate children, attitudes to non-Jews, OCD, which um, Dr. Lerntal spoke about before, uh, the prenuptial agreements, partnership minyonim, queer Jews, issues of rape, suicide, secular studies, triage, university studies, vegetarianism and Judaism, women's issues, Zionism and territorial concessions, all of these can be found, we can have teshuvot, we do have, in the response to literature of the giants of halakha in the 20th century, uh, lengthy discussions which are all couched in halachic terms and revolve around the, the uh, halakha, the law, the legal system, but uh, the keen eye, and especially in academic circles, will realize that many of these discussions are also, or really perhaps, about values. And the question remains about the relationship between law and values, between the legal system of Judaism, the intransigent halakha, the words of Maimonides, and at the same time the values and sometimes the clashes that exist between the person who wants to give matanot lev yonim, <coughs> being loyal to the letter of the law, he's worried about next year, but at the same time, if his consciousness of the spirit of the law would be alert, then of course he realizes that the most important thing of matanot lev yonim is to make sure that the needs of the destitute are met. So I would like to look at this in general terms and then specifically to home in on perhaps a Chabad, a typical Chabad contribution to the cause. Um, let us talk, let's give one example, fertility issues. So, um, Take, for example, of Moshe Feinstein, born in 1895, passed away in 1986, uh, famously allowed um, employing the means of artificial insemination using donor sperm, AID, uh, for the purpose of um, a woman whose husband couldn't provide her with a, a child. Um, in recent circles, that's even been adopted by some Orthodox women in Israel who are not married and can't find a, a spouse. And they've availed themselves of donor sperm for the purpose of having children. And in the early 1960s, there was an extensive debate uh, and a lot of polemics around this subject and the permissive ruling of Rabbi Feinstein that said that the practice is actually allowed and halachically speaking, uh, is uh, unquestionable. Uh, this was disputed by many others, but until the last letter he wrote on the subject was in the early 1980s when he wrote to a certain Rabbi Getzel Ellinson that he's never changed his mind. From a halachic perspective, there's no question that this is the position. Now, in the, the correspondence, Rab Moshe argues forcefully that uh, there is nothing but halacha that guides him. He is not influenced by any external, external sciences or uh, philosophies or agendas. Um, it's pure halakha. It's all about Jewish law. Yet in the very first responsum that Rabbi Feinstein penned on this issue, 
um, to a certain Rabbi Baruch Gross in 1961. Um, Almost a third of the responsum is the first paragraph in which he says as follows. He describes what happened, that a woman went and uh, had herself impregnated, and he explains why she did this. Uh, because, he says, we know that uh, the maternal instinct is very strong, the drive to have children is a great force, uh, even according to the Talmud, you have Amot 65b, she's entitled, it's understandable that a woman wants uh, the social and moral support of children in her old age, and even posthumously. Um, and the leitmotif of the story of the matriarchs in Genesis is, uh, in the words of uh, Rachel, Genesis chapter 30, banim v'imayin metanochi. Uh, the, and he, in, rather than saying that this is something uh, spiritual, uh, for Rachel as a sort of a servant, uh, a maidservant of God, it's, no, he says, this is something which is normal for all women. Uh, the matriarchs were expressing here the maternal quest, which is part of the makeup of every woman. And then he goes on to discuss the, the, the reason that it, it, the practice is legitimate. It's clear that uh, Rabbi Feinstein was first establishing the fact that for him there was a value, a great value in accommodating the needs of women who couldn't have birth in the natural, give birth, have children in the natural way. It was important for him to establish the significance, if not the omnisignificance, significance of children for a woman and the fact that the Torah itself expresses this value. We'll come to that soon. The Torah itself uh, gives expression to this value. So although it may not be a halacha per se, um, it is a Torah value. And whilst his, the rest of his discourse is couched in halachic terms, there's no question in my mind that he was informed by the meta-halachic considerations in this first paragraph. If we contrast this, for example, with the uh, legal writings of contemporary Rabbi David J. Bleich on issues of fertility, we will see that he is not so um, excited about these meta-halachic issues. For him, it's, is it a mitzvah, is it not a mitzvah? If it's an obligation, then... If it's not an obligation, then um, why should we do anything that may involve the slightest doubt. Um, because it's from a purely halachic perspective, everything revolves around the commandment. Is there a commandment? Is there not a commandment? Um, even practices such as AIH, artificial insemination using husband sperm, have been called into doubt by some rabbis when the practice first became available uh, in the early 20th century. And, um, uh, and even recently, in this year, in a book called Vazaram Lefanecha Yikon, published in 5777, 2017, uh, still rabbi is opposing that anything but um, natural, extremely natural uh, childbearing, no artificial procreation or I- interference whatsoever. Now, um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, for example, although he did not approve of AID, I hasten to add, when he was asked about um, AIH or similar practices, he said, uh, we have, he frequently said and wrote, we have a tradition from uh, my father-in-law that Afhoban kinder musman moise nefeshan, or musman hoban mesiris nefesh, that um, in order to have children, one ought to have self-sacrifice. However one understands the bleak, the the phrase, what he is saying is that having children is in itself a a value, a colossal value in uh, in, in, in Judaism. And therefore, 
if it's a, if there is halachic latitude for to allow the practice, then one ought to allow oneself to one ought to avail oneself of the lenient views in order to be able to fulfill this goal. So it's not just about five more minutes. No. Uh, it's not just about uh, the the, um, the the halacha. It's about the value that is behind it. Now. What is the relationship between the meta-halachic and the halachic? So you get radical academics and sometimes even rabbis who will say where there is rabbinic will is halachic way. Halacha is plasticine. You can uh, bend it whichever way you wish. Hakol gamish. It's all flexible. And uh, then for them, halacha just becomes kigaz and biyad like a, a manipulative tool that you can use whichever way you want. Um, you get uh, people doing this for reasons of, for, for a variety of reasons. I don't have time to go into the, the various examples of how this is done. Um, in the early 1930s, an interesting correspondence and discussion broke out between the uh, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok Schneerson, a rabbi of Chabad descent uh, in, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Rabbi uh, Ari Leib Nimoitin, and uh, the Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the last rabbi of Chabad, regarding the following question. The person had studied in Hasidic thought the ideas that uh, the rabbis of the Talmud of rabbinic thought, uh, classical rabbinic thought, were influenced uh, by the heavenly attributes, the divine attributes. So, for example, the reason why uh, Shammai, Beth Shammai are strict is because they are rooted in the attribute of severity, judgment, gvura. The reason why Beth Hillel are Lenient is because they are rooted in midat chesed, in kindness, benevolence, etc. And he struggled with this notion because he found this goes against the uh, traditional concept of Torah um, le'bashamayimhi. The Torah is not in heaven, and uh, something which Maimonides weighed in particularly heavily in the ninth chapter of Yisudei Torah and in other places. Uh, and insisted that Jewish law is not to be decided through metaphysical or celestial forces. It's supposed to be very down to earth, on earth. Uh, the constitution is made by the rabbis, legal practitioners, jurisprudential scholars, not prophets and not angels, certainly not questions provided to heaven. So this rabbi struggled with this notion that Hasidic thought taught that actually the ideas are influenced by uh, metaphysical concepts, which are uh, not part of the halachic regime. Now, uh, th there's a very interesting correspondence, which I hope to provide in my written form of the paper. Um, but what I'd like to suggest, and this is the crux, two more points I need to say, um, of the idea. There is an interesting, uh, which I think one formulation may be as follows. Uh, in a discourse of the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya in the Kutitayra on Shemini Atzeret, discusses the concept of the uh, second day Yom Tov. And he quotes that Rav Moses, Moshe Cordovero in his uh, Orn Erav, says that the reason that you have to have a second day Yom Tov in Chutzlaretz is because, in the diaspora, is because uh, the flow of light and uh, spiritual vitality that... Uh, emanates on the festive period, uh, needs a longer period of time to be digested, to be ingested in, in the diaspora. Whereas in Israel, being closer to the source, etc., and he gives a marshal of his own, a parable about the, the rays of the light being adulterated as they come from the source uh, in a diagonal way, so the further you are from the source of light, the more space you need to encompass uh, all the rays and hence the difference between how much space of time you need to absorb the festival and its emanations in Israel and outside of Israel. 
Now, I've often asked the question, and I put this even to teenage uh, students in class, and said as follows. So, if you read the Talmud, Tractate Beitza, uh, in the beginning of the first chapter, you come away with a very clear understanding. The reason we keep the second day Yom Tov is because once upon a time in Babylon, they didn't know which day of the month it was. And therefore, they had to keep two days. Even though nowadays that's no longer a concern, but for various reasons, minhag avotenu biyadenu, we um, uh, follow the practice of our ancestors. Why can't we change it? Okay, there are legal uh, bureaucratic procedures. Uh, we can't override the custom, we can't override the institution. Uh, and, uh, you need to have a superior Besdin to override it. So why do we keep two days Yom Tov? Do we keep two days Yom Tov because we are still bound in slavish, slavish subservience to the practice in Babylon? Uh, uh, or do we keep two days Yom Tov because of a consciousness, a sense that we still need more time for this festive message, vitality, to penetrate, to permeate. The answer, of course, is, uh, well, the way I put it is this. It depends. The halakha tells us how you get from A to B. The panimiyut, the esoteric, tells us why we get from A to B. The two systems are not in contradiction to each other. They are parallel systems. Or to put it in the words, uh, in Chabad parlance, if something is true, if something is a met, it's a briach hatichon hamavriach min hakatzeh al hakatzeh. It is something which is going to be manifest, understandable, and identifiable on whichever level we are going to talk about it. So therefore, in heavenly terms, the reason that the schools of Shammai and Hillel disagree is because of the variety of divine attributes which find expression in the souls and therefore legal verdicts of these respective scholars and houses of study, Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel. On an earthly level, these find expressions through the hermeneutics and intellectual dialectic of Talmudic argumentation. The fact that we don't see any direct correlation between the two doesn't matter because there is something higher than both that permeates all the way through and that allows this truth to be expressed and found, whether pursued from the logical, earthly perspective or through the legal system and its parameters, or whether it is looking at it through the lenses of the metaphysical and uh, soul-searching experience. Now, I'm coming to the end. So what's this got to do with uh, today and the question of um, spirituality uh, for everyone and for youth in particular? I think that um, one of the, uh, I already alluded to before, one of the tensions that we find between um, Spirit, in, in, the, in the quest for spirituality in religious circles is precisely between the spirit and the letter. Um, Rabbi Nachum Greenwald, who's here with us today, has written in his book, Harav, about the school of uh, Brisk, in which the halakha is for the sake of the observance of the halakha. Any discussion about a goal-orientated halakha, like the Kabbalists spoke about theurgic, influence or uh, the philosophers spoke about pedagogic or um, utilitarian values in halakha would be completely strange to them. Uh, there is an advantage because that uh, maximizes adherence to the law and in the absence of the law we have chaos. So there is something to be said for a strong emphasis on legality which avoids the dangers of antinomianism. On the other hand, uh, Failure to understand the fact that halakha is, in a sense, a receptacle for something higher, or rather, a, it, it is not just sterile practice because that is the will of God, but there is also, in addition to that, a purpose that God is trying to, a 
achieve through the system of halakha, a divine tachlit, it's very important because otherwise we end up with the Lamont Tizka resistance syndrome that we spoke about at the beginning. But then how do we avoid becoming cynical when we speak about, if you say, well, we go according to the values, so what happens, so the letter of halakha becomes insignificant. When you speak about the letter of halakha, uh, then you have to ignore the values. It's not a choice between rabbinic will, halachic way on the one hand, or everything is just about a depersonalized system of halakha. The, the, uh, the, the explanation of truth being conceived and understood on a number of different levels, which enables for the integration and awareness of the values that we're pursuing, whilst not in any way denigrating or downplaying the significance of the legal system through which the ideas have got to become formulated and, man and, and, and applied, is something which we, uh, I've provided from the Chabad perspective a specific uh, uh, um, method, methodology, and I think that that can be a fruitful ground to yield um, new ways of educating <coughs> when we speak specifically about spirituality and legality in all quarters. Thank you.